the super cycle has returned. Now, if you've been watching my videos for a while now, you know that I love to look at cycles. Everything in life comes down to getting the timing right and studying cycles helps us to spot the trends and then to ride the waves. And for the last eight to 10 months, I've been talking about one of the biggest trends that's beginning to shift and of course what to do about it. And it's only getting bigger and now it's formed what is being called the super cycle. So in this video, I'm gonna break down what this super cycle is. We're gonna look at the last four times we've seen this over the last 100 years. We're gonna break down what's driving it, what assets are moving because of it, and a few ways that you can position yourself to profit from this as it continues to unfold over the next decade. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I make these videos, of course, to change the way you think about money because almost everything you've learned is wrong. Almost everything that we're seeing today is wrong. And I try to make sense of these things. And of course, I like to look at cycles, the way things tend to repeat. Of course, uh, the saying is that things don't always repeat, but they rhyme. And that's exactly what we're talking about. So I wanna show you how we're seeing these cycles um, compete, or I'm sorry, repeat over and over rhyming. And so we're talking about this super cycle today. All right, um, this isn't just a cycle, it's a super cycle, it's a big one. There's only been four in the last 100 years, let's take a look at that. So we're talking about today, we're talking about the commodity super cycle. Of course, I've been talking about this for several months now, so you should be caught up, but I haven't shown you this data yet. And so the commodities, of course, we're talking about real things, oil, food, base metals, agricultural products, real things, real tangible things. I talk about all the time, money isn't wealth, money measures wealth, me money helps us acquire wealth, wealth is real goods, things that we need to survive like food, like energy, all right? And the base, the ba you know, base metals that go into making things. Now there's been four great cycles over the last 100 years that have been amazing if you've been able to catch that wave and ride that trend, and that's what we're gonna take a look at. Now we can see that these cycles are tied to transformational periods. So these are periods of time where the whole world changes, and that's exactly what, what, what's caused them and exactly what we're taking a look at. Now we can see this here, if we want to map this out, here's over the last 100 years right here. And so starting at 1900, we can see how these cycles move. Obviously some get much higher and some get lower than the next, but they tend to start growing as you can see. Um, so we can kind of map that out like this. Now what's important to understand is that each one um, tend to have extended periods due to something called the SD imbalance. You know what that is? I talk about it all the time, SD, supply and demand. When there's an imbalance in supply and demand, there's an oversupply or there's too much demand, there's an imbalance one way. Now typically these super cycles, these commodity super cycles, we're gonna break it down more, don't worry about it, uh, last about 10 plus years. And so I've been talking about this for about eight or 10 months now. I've done multiple videos on this. You haven't missed it. It's not too late. They typically last about 10 years. And of course, like I said, the cycle is here right now. So let's break this down a little bit for you. All right. So like I said, there's been four previous cycles in the last 100 years. And I have a map here, 1910. This is when the industrialization of the United States happened. So we had the oil boom in 1908. We had automobiles, then we had uh, mass production, and then the United States started to become industrialized. This created a massive boom for commodities. We needed metal, we needed gold, we needed oil, we needed all those parts, aluminum, steel, et cetera, to industrialize to build up the United States. Then we saw about 20 years later, look at the time frames of these cycles, about 20 years later, we had the rearmament before World War II. So World War I happened, created a ma you know, massive supply um, imbal imbalance where we used up a lot of the equipment. Uh, and then we had World War II, we had to rearm. So we had to build all that back out again. Um, a lot of economists have talked about how war is good for the economy because it puts so many people to work and it really drove this period where we had to rebuild everything before World War II. Then 1960, this time is about 30 years, 20, 30 years. Uh, Reindustrialization in Europe after World War II. So in World War II, Europe got bombed, everything got destroyed, and it had to be reindustrialized. And again, we saw a massive boom in commodities. We had way too much demand because we needed to rebuild while we didn't have enough supply. 
We saw that again in 2000, there was the industrialization of the BRIC nations. BRIC stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China, uh, emerging markets, if you will. And so we've seen them starting to industrialize. Of course, China, we've talked about that extensively. They have built giant cities and roads and bridges to nowhere. They've taken a huge amount of the supplies, the commodities, you know, concrete, glass, steel, things like that to build that out. And if we look at this um, over these four periods in a chart here, we can see them mapped out. Now they started a little smaller, but you can see how they start to swing more and more and more. Now this chart ends here in 2018 and we got down to about here and now it's just going to start going straight up here. So you can see the way this kind of moves through, but as the world becomes more globalized, as there's more and more demand for these commodities. Now remember, commodities have a finite amount. Now sure, we can get more of them out, but it takes more resources, unlike money that we can just print unlimited amounts of. And so we can see how these um, ebb and flow through time, and we're about to take off again. So let's break this down a little bit more. I talked about the S and D imbalance. Of course, I'm talking about supply and demand. So we can see the catalysts that are driving this next super cycle, which is said to be the biggest commodity super cycle that we've ever seen at least out of the last four in the last 100 years. So the catalyst, so S and D, supply and demand. So we have shrinking supply, that's the first problem. We have shrinking supply, so for example, we have deglobalization. The world has experienced a period of globalization where the world has become smaller, if you will, and we've had supply chains moving stuff all around the world, but today with uh, first with the pandemic and then the war, we're starting to see this deglobalized. Supply chains are breaking down. China's not shipping supplies. There's no fertilizer leaving um, Russia, things like that. And so the deglobalization is causing a lack of supplies to the world. You know this, it's all over the news. We also have massive amounts of underinvestment. That's been a big problem. Again, you can see it all over the news. Lum lumber and chip shortages have been the same root cause. Of course, underinvestment. Last week, the Biden administration sent a letter to the um, refinery saying, hey, you need to make more gas. And they said, look, we can't make more gas. There will be no new refineries coming online because it takes 10 years to build one out and it takes another 10 years to be profitable and nobody will put more money, will invest more money into this market when you're trying to tell us to shut things down. So there's been massive underinvestment that's happened. And then on top of it, we had the pandemic. So the whole world was shut down. Mines weren't running. There was no copper, zinc, gold um, coming out of the ground. There was no, because of the pandemic, and now, of course, the war. So these are all things that have massively impacted the supply. Now, when we talk about real things, now we can go print a trillion dollars, with the click of a button. But to get real things out of the ground like copper, zinc, lithium, uh, aluminum, steel, etc., especially when it comes to oil, natural gas, it could take three years, five years, seven years, or in the case of the refinery, a decade before that comes online. So when you stop investing into those sectors and then you decide, oh shoot, we have a problem, we don't have enough supply, you don't just get it back like that. It takes years and years to come back from it. We can see some of this under investment, under supply in some charts right here. So here we have copper and you can see how the amount of copper has just been going down and down and down. There has been no new discoveries. The bright blue is the part that's been showing up uh, the amount of new copper in major discoveries. And as you can see, there's hardly any blue right here. The, yellow line right here is the amount of copper in exploration budgets. So we didn't have a huge demand for it. We didn't need to um, continue to expand <clears throat> over the last you know, 30 years or so, but now where we really need it, there's no money going into it. And even more alarming charts are these right here. So here's the aluminum stock, it's going down. Here's the copper stock, it's going down. We have nickel, Supplies going down, zinc going down. That shows you just how bad of a supply problem we have. All right, now what about the demand? If they're not investing into copper and zinc and aluminum, if they're not investing into it, does that mean nobody wants it? Does that mean there's no future where we need those things? 
because you would think if we actually need those things in the future, people would be investing them to the, in, in them today, but that doesn't appear, appear to be the case. Let's take a look. So catalyst, we have a rising demand. What is causing the demand for more of these things and why the heck aren't we investing into them? Well, we have the green agenda, of course. The green agenda wants to reimagine the entire world. They want to put solar panels and windmills across the entire world. Uh, they want to build uh, solar or EV charging stations across the whole world. In order to do that, we need lots of copper and steel and lithium and cobalt and all of those things. Of course, we can see the rise of electric vehicles. Here we are, here we are in uh, 2022 and they're expecting um, electric vehicles to go up like this, which means we need a lot more of these commodities that of course we're not investing into. We can also see here, this is the copper, uh, the amount of copper that we're gonna need. Again, we are right here, and we're gonna need way more copper over the next couple of years. We're also going to need a lot more um, nickel, as you can see, we're right here. So nickel is continued, <laughs> expected to go up. Uh, copper is expected to go up, the EV boom is expected to go up, but yet we're not investing into these things. So you see what I'm talking about? The imbalance between supply and demand. We also have massive amounts of high inflation or and or debasement. So when they print more money, your existing money loses value. And what happens is when they're printing trillions of dollars, when they're printing unlimited amounts of fake fiat currency, people want to go buy real hard things. They can't print more gold or nickel or silver or oil. They can't print more of that. And so people will be, uh, will be fleeing this fake found, uh, counterfeit money and going to these commodities. Now, how do we position ourselves for this? All right, now I've talked about this in many videos. You've been hopefully paying attention and catching on. There's a few ways to do it. Of course, you can buy an ETF. An ETF is a basket that could cover a bunch of commodities. Um, or we can do more direct plays. You can buy copper directly, you can buy gold directly, you can buy oil futures con contracts directly. Of course, like I said, I've been talking about this quite a bit. So there's ways you can do that. Um, here's a list. You can just easily search like metal and mining ETF list. list. And here you can see a bunch of ETFs. And so you can kind of DYOR, do your own research on that. Here's the one that I've been talking about for a long time. We've been doing really, really good on. Here since 2016, you can see it took a dip into March of 2020 but look how high it is. It's still sitting at all time highs. We're up about 80% on this since we've been talking about it. Now, gold, Bitcoin, uh, Shopify, <laughs> Uh, Tesla, you name it, they're all down. But here we are on the commodities index still at an all-time high at the time when most of the markets are getting absolutely crushed. This is what we talk about, this rotation out of most growth stocks and into commodities like this. Now, for some of you guys, you want a little bit more leverage. I get it. 6% a year, 8% a year, 20% a year isn't even exciting. So if some people want to use a little more leverage, now you can do that using options. Of course, you can do like oil futures. Do you think oil is gonna be cheaper or more expensive in the future? Do you think it'll be worth, uh, be more than $200 a barrel? You can do option contracts that'll be worth $200 in the future. You can do those at you know three months, four months, six months, 12 months out, the ways to play that. The problem with doing that is that one, you have to get the direction right. Will oil go higher or will it go lower? So you have to get the direction right. But you also have to get the timing right. Let's say that you bet for um, the commodities to go up in value and you're correct, they do, but you got the timing wrong. So you, get, you have to be right on both of those, which makes it a little bit more difficult. So let me show you a way that you could sort of do a leverage play without having the risk of the time frame and open market liquidity. Now, uh, quick disclaimer for you, really quick. I am doing a review of a company right here that we're gonna use for this example. I am not telling you to go buy this stock, uh, but we are gonna use it as an example of a way that you can play a leverage position in this commodity super cycle. All right, so we're looking at a company called Star Peak for our example. Now, Star Peak is a, is a mining company that is specifically in this space. They've discovered a VMS deposit. So what is that? It stands for Vol Volcanogenic Massive Sulfide. And what that means is that they've discovered lots of base metals. So they have copper, zinc, silver and gold. So we could play a gold play, we could play a silver play, we could play a copper play. Or you have a position like this that has a VMS deposit that has all of those minerals as one. So 
Maybe gold does really good. I think it will. Silver could do good. I think copper could do good. I think zinc could do good. They could all do good at different times, or you can have one play that gets them all. Now, these are pretty rare. There's only about 350 VMS deposits in all of Canada, and Star Peak has found one. They've been drilling into this new land, um, looking for these mineral deposits, and so far they've found nine out of their 10 holes. A 90% ratio has been able to hit these minerals, which is, again, uh, crazy numbers. One out of 10 is a pretty good number. Nine out of 10 is insane. Now, you can apply this or, or, or play this sort of like a non-expiring call option. So we talked about the options before. I could say, hey, in six months, oil will be more. In six months, copper, zinc, gold will be more. The problem is those expire. So even if we're right on the direction, they expire. Or you could buy a company like this that gives you massive leverage. A miner gives you massive leverage because of what they have in the ground and it doesn't expire. You're just playing the, the, the direction that'll go up, but without having to put <clears throat> a time frame on that. Now, Star Peak is in Canada, which is a very good mining district, and they are positioned right in the middle of some of the best deposits in the world. We're gonna take a look at that, all right? It's also sort of like a, an insider play. Now, not insider trading. <laughs> this is the closest you can get to like an insider play without having insider trading that's a problem. But what I, what I mean by insider play, well, right now, about 40% of the company is owned by the managers. So you're always looking for a company where the owners, where the management have skin in the game, right? Incentives. I talk about that all the time. You want to make sure that our incentives are aligned. We both have skin in the game. Now, the management is not selling, all right? It's at a massive discounted valuation. Of course, the mining sector has been pretty decimated. Um, so it's down about 75% from its peak, which I'm not into catching falling knives, but I do like to buy things when they're cheap and when they're on sale. And so what you're trying to do is try to find once the trend has bottomed and it's already starting to go back up. I've been talking about this trend, this commodities boom for six, eight, 10 months now. The trend is developed. The bottom could be in and it could be a good, <coughs> good time to get it at a discount. Now, a neighboring company, Amex, it soared over 10X. So Amex Exploration discovered massive deposits. And you can see that Star Peak sits right next to where the Amex Exploration is. So it's right in the middle of all these really good fields. So success leaves clues. If they found huge deposits right here, then chances are we could find really big deposits here. And that's exactly what the results have been showing. Like I said, nine out of 10 holes have hit. On top of that, if there's one name that you probably have heard of in the mining, in the natural resource space, it's of course, Eric Sprott. Uh, he's a legend in the space. He made money in Amex. He made so much money in Amex that he decided to join the board of Star Peak to play this trend as well. All right, now um, playing Star Peak is also sort of like a venture capital play. All right, so venture capital, we can get in very early into some companies that could have explosive growth, and then you play and wait them out. Hopefully, whatever product they're designing gets a good market fit, the market likes it and rewards it for that, and that's sort of kind of what you could look at this as as well. You know, it is a exploration company. They're exploring and they're getting good results. But in order for us to make this 10x return that we're hopefully gonna be able to make, then we need them to have more success and eventually be a target of a merger and acquisition. We call that M&A. And so we can kind of have a venture opportunity where if this hits and if the market values it and wants to buy this company, we make a 10x return. All right, now, when you're in typical venture capital, um, you're buying companies that are illiquid. I'm gonna buy this company, I'm gonna wait for six, seven, eight, ten 10 years, and hopefully at some point there'll be a liquidity event. Maybe they'll go public and I can actually sell my shares or somebody will buy them out. It's not the best position to be in when the markets are uncertain like they are today. So we get sort of like a venture opportunity upside, but we get it with liquidity today, which means it's already being publicly traded. So we can get in and out of the position if we want. Now, I do think this is going to be a MNA target, a mergers and acquisition target, because as I said, this space is massively underinvested. And so as we need more copper and zinc, as I showed you, the supplies are dwindling very fast. What happens is the majors that have been under investing will need to come and acquire the small explorers. That's the way the place work, the, the entire play works. And so it could be a good M&A target. Now we have an advantage over a strategic buyer. So let's say that a bigger company wanted to come buy them. 
and they would come and say, hey, uh, you know, we want to buy, uh, buy you out at the price you're at today. Well, the 40% uh, management owned company would say, we're not selling you at this discounted price that we're at today. The market has undervalued us and we're going to be coming up over time. So, they, so the buyer, potential buyer could say, okay, fine, then I'll go buy you on the public markets because your stock's public. What would happen is as they started acquiring massive amounts of stock, the price would be going up like crazy and they'd be paying higher and higher amounts. So we have an advantage over a strategic buyer where we can come in and buy it at the discounted price today, which is pretty good. And we can control our downside with a stop loss. Now, I've talked about these types of plays before. I get the comments in my videos. Oh, it dropped big time since you talked about it. Hey, these are venture type plays. These are risky plays. These are home run plays, but we have the benefit of using stop losses. Always protect your risk. Always protect your downside. So run a 10, run a 25% stop loss to manage your risk, but we can, we can limit our risk at say 15 or 20% on the downside and we can have an unlimited upside. That's the benefit of doing something like this. All right, now the world's changed, all right? I've been saying, I've been making this case for a long time. I like to think of this quote of Warren Buffett right here. He says that the stock market's a device for transferring money from the inpatient to the patient. The patient are able to identify a trend early. They're able to see the trend develop. They're able to get in at the early part of that trend and then they patiently wait for that trend to develop. As I showed you, these commodity super cycles typically last about a decade. This isn't for the impatient, this is for the patient. These provide massive returns if you spot the trend right and you can patiently wait it out. The debasement is happening. The governments will have to continue to print more money. As they print more money, people are going to want to buy real things. We have massive supply and demand imbalances. Even if they had a magic wand and they fix this, it's going to take three to seven years, depending on the type of commodity, to get more of that supply on the market. This is a massive trend, a 10 year trend that's shaping up. And if you're patient, you can take advantage of it. All right, but leave me a comment down below. Are you impatient or are you patient? Are you patient like Warren Buffett says? Uh, leave me a comment, let me know. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. And if you don't like the video, that's okay. You can give me a thumbs down, but at least leave me a comment and let me know why. And that's what I got for you today, all right? To your success, I'm out. Since you've stayed to the end, I know you like this video, which means you're probably gonna really like this video right here and this video right here.